recording will be publicly on the um, BHA website just for parity of information um, because we will be engaging in open discussion and Q&A. Um, can I just get a sense, like a thumbs up from folks if people are seeing the screen and are hearing me okay? Just wanna make sure, okay, I'm seeing some thumbs up. Great. Okay. Awesome. All right, thanks folks. Um, so we're super excited to be here today uh, to be sharing out the admin burden CCARD DACODS modernization report. Um, again, the session is being recorded and will be posted publicly, so it's up to you how you're comfortable participating today. Um, we'll be going through a couple of housekeeping items before we jump in um, to the content of today's presentation. Um, if you don't know me, hi everybody, my name is Abigail Fisher and I use she, her pronouns. Uh, and today uh, I will be presenting the results of the admin burden, CCAR DACODS modernization report. I'm an experienced designer on the BHA's technology team and I wanna thank all members of our team who contributed to this body of work and wanna especially highlight the co-authors of this report, Chris Pimlott and Mark Gammon. We'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement drafted by Denver City Council. We honor and acknowledge that the land on which we reside is the traditional territory of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho peoples. We also recognize the 48 contemporary tribal nations that are historically tied to the lands that make up the state of Colorado. We honor elders past, present, and future, and those who have stewarded this land throughout generations. We also recognize that government, academic, and cultural institutions were founded upon and continue to enact exclusions and erasures of indigenous peoples. May this acknowledgement demonstrate a commitment to working to dismantle ongoing legacies of oppression and inequities and recognize the current and future contributions of indigenous communities in Denver and across Colorado. Today, we'll be going over our research findings and our recommendations for a roadmap forward on CCAR DACOD's modernization. This session marks the beginning of a comprehensive engagement period for these recommendations to ensure we are holding space for co-creation with providers and people seeking care in Colorado. I'll be presenting findings out for around 45 minutes, and then we'll be holding about 45 minutes for discussion. We might not have all the necessary people or information to answer all questions today, but we will certainly follow up with answers as needed. We know that many providers are eager to give feedback on this work, and we have many ways for you to engage and share your thoughts, including attending live sessions like this. During the session, we want to engage in as much discussion as possible. Feel free to share your thoughts in the chat while I present. We will also hold time at the end for open discussion, as I mentioned. I'll be monitoring the chat throughout the presentation, but I won't be stopping to answer questions, but rather waiting until I go through them all, uh, all of the slides, um, and I will address them at the beginning of open discussion. Additionally, for those who prefer to give feedback anonymously, we have a feedback form you can fill out anytime before October 27th, which Megan, um, my colleague, will drop in chat. This form will be shared um, and is posted on the project's website as well. Um, all pieces of feedback will be posted and responded to publicly by the BHA, a process we will talk more about at the end of this presentation. Finally, before we begin, we want to deeply thank everyone who participated in this research. We know that every hour spent with us is an hour away from supporting clients. We take this responsibility seriously and credit the recommendations in this report as solutions created by those closest to the problem. All right, so let's get into it. Um, as I go through this presentation, one of the key questions I would love you to consider is whether these recommendations um, would provide a better balance for you as a provider between administrative burden, federal requirements, and measures of quality and access. So what do I mean by that? Well, we know that as the BHA, we have to balance how federal requirements place administrative burden on providers. These federal requirements seek to establish measures of quality and access for the state's behavioral health system. Today, we know that these factors are not in balance from the experience of providers, and this re report seeks to begin to address that imbalance. Addressing administrative burden is even written into the BHA's founding legislation. It's something we're taking very seriously and are acting on with urgency. And you can see here the balance between um, 
administrative burden as well as measures of uh, quality of care and accessibility of care written into House Bill 22-1278. The BHA is a little over a year old, and we're still digging our way out of the technology debt accrued by our predecessor, which plays a big part in the high levels of administrative burden currently experienced by providers engaged with the BHA. This report provides recommendations to better balance the administrative burden caused by CCAR DACOD's reports. This will be one of many projects at the BHA to address different causes of administrative burden, as we know that CCAR and DACODs are not the only causes. These five recommendations summarize our findings. Throughout the rest of the presentation, we will share details on how we arrived at these recommendations and how we plan to act on them. So I'll read through these um, to, to ground us in these recommendations before we provide more detail on how we arrived at these recommendations. So first of all, we know it's imperative for us to update the data model that underpins CCAR day codes. Um, we need to do this through relevant stakeholdering with providers, with people from with lived experience, um, and with the federal review process with SAMHSA. We need to map our data model to culturally competent best practices, um, making improvements to data elements like gender, race, and ethnicity for front front end presentation to providers and for people seeking care while still mapping back to federal requirements um, in terms of their data input. Next, we need to select a data entry system. We'll perform an analysis of internal existing internal and external technology systems based on recommended design parameters in order to select a new front-facing data entry system for the BHA providers. We need to build for episodic reporting. Building a reporting environment where we can collect data episodically, aggregating encounters into episodes of care so that providers can get a more comprehensive uh, look at uh, a client's care history in order to make better informed care decisions. Fourth, we need to create a data analysis dashboard or many data analysis dashboards um, to create standard and customizable dashboards so providers can track progress towards contractual requirements as well as measures of equity. And finally, we know we need to prioritize engagement, including creating a robust external communication and engagement plan for providers, people seeking care, and other stakeholders in order to foster trust and transparency around this work effort. So I'll spend the rest of the presentation, again, um, unpacking how we came to these findings and recommendations, and also how we will begin to implement them. So to begin, um, let's unpack why this research was important to conduct. Those on this call can speak to this far better than I ever could, but we know that behavioral health care providers that care for uninsured, underinsured, and undocumented people have to hurdle extreme um, and unequitable bureaucratic barriers. Accepting any insurance is a hurdle for behavioral health providers, and even more so for Medicaid. Add another state agency funding stream or program and administrative requirements can quickly double or triple. We know that the more requirements you have, the more technology systems you have to engage with as a provider. These factors create complex tech ecosystems for you to engage with, far outweighing what providers that only access private insurance face. Understanding this, it's easy to see the connection between the behavioral health workforce shortage and the high levels of administrative burden experienced by providers who access public funding in Colorado. Um, And this slide showcases a couple of news stories about this workforce um, shortage, which I'm sure you, you all are aware of. This report is part of a broader state effort to address this problem. There are many efforts at the BHA and other state agencies to address administrative burden. This report is the BHA technology team's contribution to this wider body of work. We have and will continue to share these findings with other efforts to maximize our impact. And some of these other groups you may or may not have heard of, um, but we have a universal contracting provision work group at the BHA, and there are many data model standardization groups um, across the state of Colorado and also nationally. We know that one of the major causes of administrative burden at the BHA are CCAR and DACOD's reports. 
Providers that engage with the BHA through contracts to access additional funding and or to provide opioid treatment programs must fill out CCAR day cards. CCARs are for mental health services and day cards are for substance use services. More detail about which providers have to submit CCAR day cards can be found in the full report um, and Megan will share the, the project website that contains that full document as well as this presentation in case you want to take a, a closer look at any of these slides. As we stated at the beginning of the presentation, there are many sources of administrative burden caused by the BHA, but we very intentionally began with CCAR day cards because those reports are the most prevalent and currently harmful to providers. We will tackle other sources of, of admin burden in parallel with the implementation of these resources and recommendations. Unfortunately, um, it's true that we cannot simply do away with CCAR day cards as much as we might like to. Uh, they do stem from reporting requirements um, uh, coming down from SAMHSA for block grants that the BHA then passes on to providers in terms of BHA program funding streams. This is similar to how CMS requires reporting from HICPUF on Medicaid enrolled providers. Many people have rightfully asked, why can't the BHA simply pull the necessary data from other sources? Unfortunately, through this research, we found that there is enough difference in the type of data required by SAMHSA that there will likely, at least for the near future, always need to be some data collected from providers by the BHA. However, wherever we see duplication, um, we will certainly build pathways to eliminate that deduplication. That being said, there is much we can do to improve data quality, tech usability, and reduce administrative burden while still meeting federal requirements. And that includes addressing the clinically outdated data model and the antiquated technology systems that underpin CCAR and DACODs today. We know that one of the major pain points for CCAR DACODs are the aging technology systems in use. Those technology systems are called CCAR and TMS. We want to sh really shout out our system specialists who have helped to keep these systems going in the face of limited resources for nearly 20 years. That being said, there's a lot of work to do to improve um, this aging technological infrastructure. We also know that the data model being used today for CCAR day cards is outdated and harmful. For instance, today CCAR and DACODs require providers to ask their clients their sexual orientation, something providers themselves typically would not ask within their intake processes. There are certain questions that CCAR DACODs must ask because they are dictated by the federal government. Other questions, however, were added by the OBH, um, currently now the BHA, because they wanted to collect additional demographic information for state data analysis. Our recommendations include minimizing data elements to only those that the BHA can solid, solidly defend, either due to federal requirements or a strong use case supported by providers for quality access measures that would then be shared back to providers, the general public, and people seeking care. It's imperative that the BHA address the administrative burden and negative impact on provider-client relationships caused by CCAR day cards, while also remaining in compliance with federal requirements. And we really believe that this is possible. The recommendations that follow in this presentation will address those concerns. The pro proposed roadmap also considers how this work will integrate and support other administrative burden efforts across the state. Next, we wanna spend a few minutes detailing our research methodology. Um, many of you on this call might have even participated in this research. So thank you again, if you did. Um, we focused our research on CCAR day cards as we've discussed. I think it's especially important to call out the emphasis here on how administrative burden impacts clients and people seeking care. The BHA's ultimate mission is to improve behavioral health for people in Colorado. So all of our work must have that lens. Um, and that certainly shows up in how we focused our research for this particular project. We executed both primary and secondary research during this project. 
From March through July of 2023, we talked with 16 provider organizations across Colorado, which included representation of a variety of tech setups, geographies, mental health settings, service offerings, and population expertise. We conducted hour-long interviews and virtual site visits with over 60 individuals from those 16 provider organizations, representing a range of roles and titles, including clinicians, administrative front desk staff, data and tech teams, clinical managers, and executive leadership. We also did extensive secondary research on policy, legislation, and past modernization efforts. Our methodologies are informed by co-design and the importance of designing with, not for, with the ultimate vision of design led by communities closest to the issue at hand. All right, so getting to the meat of it, um, our findings stemming from that research are as follows, and I hope that people feel free to add questions or comments in the chat as we go along. Um, we're about halfway through the presentation, and I hope to speed through these findings and recommendations to leave us pl plenty of time for open discussion at the end. Okay, so let's go through our top findings. Finding number one is that the data model for CCAR decodes is clinically and culturally out of date, especially for data elements like gender, race, and ethnicity. Next, we understood that providers are losing out on payment and accurate counts towards contractual requirements due to inflexible data intake into BHA systems and inefficient error resolution processes. Next, the distinction between CCAR and DACODs perpetuates siloing of behavioral health care and creates high levels of data duplication for the rising population of dual diagnosis clients. Next, um, as we discussed in the aging technology slide, basic usability issues, um, including account management, system timeouts, and copy and paste functionality within BHA systems today increases the time, effort, and cost required to submit compliant data by providers. Five, today the data generated by CCAR DACODs provides limited benefit to the state's behavioral health ecosystem at large. The data is currently only in active use for contract and funding requirements um, and not any larger data analysis that is shared publicly. And finally, CCAR DACOD's requirements are directly and negatively impacting how people experience behavioral health care in Colorado, especially during intake appointments. I'll pause here for a minute so folks have a, a chance to read through these and also so I can have a drink of water. All right, we'll keep going. This user story, um, which I'll pause for you to read, summarizes what we heard from providers about the experience of collecting and submitting CCAR and DACODS reports. The major takeaway here being that for one client intake appointment, it can take a provider anywhere from 30 minutes to one hour to collect and submit state reporting for the BHA. Multiply that by a full caseload, and you begin to see the magnitude of the administrative burden. One of the major factors causing admin burden for CCAR day codes is data strictness required by BHA systems. The BHA requires a customized file format that is not supported by EHRs without customization. It is up to each provider to create unique processes and systems in order to successfully create and submit this file type. Our recommendations highlight the need for increased data flexibility into state data entry systems. Finally, we heard CCAR day codes are inappropriate for many of our priority populations leading to data inaccuracy. For children, youth, and families, the CCAR is not tailored to both infants and children, so we will need to explore other reporting mechanisms and or ensure that training materials provide specific clinical guidance for this population. For undocumented people um, who can be rightfully reluctant to provide information about themselves or their families due to fear of law enforcement, we heard several times from providers that they wanted increased guidance uh, from the state about how to approach reporting requirements for this population. 
For the LGBTQIA plus population, we heard from providers, again, we talked about this, that some of the only reasons they ask clients about sexuality is because of state reporting. We, can, we should consider and really um, drill deep to ask ourselves if this data is absolutely necessary to collect, because this type of intrusive question and intake appointments can turn someone off from returning for care. We heard that providers, um, we heard from providers that the race and ethnicity options for Spanish speakers and Latin A clients were particularly confusing. We heard from providers that options for housing status are not at all appropriate for unhoused folks. And we heard um, from providers that uh, uh, facilitate opioid treatment programs that the language for drug types and administration methods are not accurate. For example, today in the CCAR DACODS reports, there's not appropriate options for fentanyl or vapes. Changes to the data model and training processes and materials covered in our recommendations seek to address these and other concerns. Hopefully it's clear how our findings built to our recommendations we reviewed at the beginning of this presentation. Each recommendation listed here is tied to one or multiple key findings. And again, I'll give folks a second to reread these key recommendations so they can see that tie between what we heard um, and what we will implement in terms of, terms of our key recommendations around updating the data model, selecting a new data entry system, building for episodic reporting, creating data analysis dashboards, um, and finally, prioritizing engagement um, on, on the execution of this plan. Today, we wanna to dig in a, a bit more and talk briefly about our third recommendation, building for episodic reporting. Something we've heard from providers across a variety of research efforts is that, is that having a more comprehensive understanding of a client's history with state services would help providers to make better care decisions. We believe that we can begin to pilot providing that more longitudinal understanding of a client's care history by linking together different service level reports, including CCAR, DACODS, and A37 encounters. Um, that would allow us to get a more holistic data story of past treatments and so that providers can get that more whole person picture. Visualized here, we believe that by moving from encounters to episodes of care within our data model and, and technology system, we could provide real benefit back to both providers and clients. This effort will of course require heavy work with people with lived experience in order to understand appropriate levels and methods for gathering consent. For the sake of time, we've let the rest of detail on um, specific recommendations one, two, four, and five for people to read on their own in the report. Um, this is the tentative timeline represents what we as the BHA can commit to today in terms of moving these recommendations forward. We put updates to the data model and updates to the tech system on different tracks, each with different engagement plans and methods. At a high level, you can see that we're using um, the rest of this year um, into June of next year in order to appropriately stakeholder changes to the data model and our tech systems with providers, people seeking care, and the federal government. Um, looking towards July of next year to begin um, to set up the system um, so that the BHA can accept changes um, to these data models. Something that is incredibly important for us to note here is that um, we will not be requiring any changes to CCAR DACODS entry for providers for at least one year after our new specifications are released in order to be respectful of providers' timelines as they update their systems. So if we go back to the previous slide, you can see that for the data model tech specifications, that would not be re released until July. Um, and for the tech system specifications, we're, we're looking at a, a similar timeline as well. We'll also be releasing a more detailed timeline within the next through within the next few months. This roadmap is built on the principles of iterative product design and management. Um, also understood as making, favoring small bets and testing plans rather than a, a large magic bullet vendor partnership. 
to dig into this concept a bit more, um, traditionally government is built with uh, is te government technology is built with a build it once for forever mindset. This method means that user feedback is typically not collected until it's too late, and con constituents are forced to use bad, antiquated, and ill-conceived tech until it literally dies years later due to faltering systems and software so old it can't meet today's security requirements. This is where the CCAR and TMS data systems are today. The roadmap outlined um, and the timeline that we shared today instead uses iterative product design and management methodologies, ensuring that the tech systems are built for change and feedback throughout its life cycle, ultimately saving the state money and drastically improving user experience. Ultimately, the success of any project in any modernization project hinges on accurate, transparent communication and engagement opportunities. We must look beyond a technical solution and into the principles of co-design to move this body of work forward. A robust engagement plan will be for formulated on this project, including the following considerations. We must engage the Behavioral Health Administration Advisory Council and other lived experience councils around uh, changes to the data model and how they want their data to be used in Colorado. We must continue to understand the impact and opportunities that BASOs will have on reporting as that plan is formalized by the BHA. We must engage in cross-agency collaboration with HICPUF, OHI, and other state agencies to share findings and align on future research and implementation work. Providers need to be kept informed throughout, through sessions like this and through public communication um, and EHR guidance, tech specifications, as well as cost analysis for this effort. And finally, um, the public, especially pe people seeking care, need consistent communication around the BHA's data and privacy policies. And this should be built into not only this project, but annual comms plans and website updates. All right, we're almost done. So calls to action and next steps. What 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 are we asking from you and, and how can you engage in this work to provide your thoughts? So first of all, um, and Megan, we can put this in the chat again, all of these great links, and they will always be on the project site that Megan already put in the chat. But we'd encourage you to read the full report, which has more detail than this presentation that we could fit in an hour and a half. Um, and also you can watch a video of this presentation and the other sessions we'll be holding this week on the project website to see other providers' feedback on this project. We also, like I mentioned, have a feedback form in case you prefer to provide feedback anonymously, which will be open until October 27th. All feedback will, submitted will get a response from the BHA and will be published publicly, which is why we're emphasizing that ability to provide feedback anonymously. And finally, we have a sign up sheet for you to get email updates on this project and other projects that are currently um, in build at the BHA. In terms of next steps, um, we will be collecting feedback on the report via form um, until October 27th. Uh, these form responses will be published with corresponding BHA responses to the project site by mid-November. The week following the publication of community feedback, we will host three more share out and discussion sessions to be scheduled. At this time, we will also be promoting additional ways to engage with this effort, um, including potential opportunities like a data model working group. Thank you so much for hanging with us for that, that full open discussion, um, that full presentation. We're now going to transition into open discussion. And as we begin, I want us to think back to that key takeaway that I started with at the beginning and ask you the question, I'll also launch a, launch a poll about whether or not these recommendations will better balance administrative burden, federal requirements, and measures of quality and access for behavioral health providers in Colorado. Thank you so much, and I um, am looking forward to answering any and all questions that you might have. And I just launched the poll as well. 
I'm going to stop sharing my screen, but I can um, pull up specific slides from that presentation um, in case we want to go back to any of that. Um, and also the slide deck is on the microsite project, the project microsite, if you want to look at any slides at any time. David, go for it. Um, yeah, I was just wondering what kind of community outreach there might have been done um, around uh, the questions of gender and sexuality during intake, uh, particularly in making them optional rather than mandatory. Um, I feel like losing that data would be more detrimental to a, a marginalized community than actually helpful, just to make it easier on providers, just, just sounds lazy. Yeah, David, that's a great question. So we we heard that piece of feedback from providers that specifically cater to LGBTQIA plus populations. So um, I think that that is a great point and is something, you know, when we talk about that balance between administrative burden um, and measures of quality and success, I think that's really something that we as a community are going to have to talk about. And like I mentioned, so I think one of the engagement opportunities that we will be providing is a specific group on data model, um, a working group in order to provide feedback on things exactly like that. So I'd encourage you to um, sign up for that, that group when we have that prepared and ready for people to sign up. Um, because I think we've definitely not arrived at any conclusions or anything final about how the data model will be updated, but instead, you know, have surfaced in this presentation that we know things aren't working and we know that we need to engage with providers and folks with lived experience to get that to a better spot, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you so much for that explanation. I'll be looking out for that small group to, to join the conversation. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, David. That's a really awesome point. In the chat, Kevin asked, at what point would the BHA engage major EHR vendors? That's an awesome question. Um, and that's something that we've been, you know, hearing across a lot of major projects at the BHA. And we've actually decided to launch an initiative where we think about an EHR interoperability strategy across BHA technology projects instead of starting with any one project. So that'll be something that you can you'll be hearing about a little bit more in the next couple of months and that will, you know be be tackled comprehensively versus with any particular piece of technology, if that makes sense. Great questions, y'all. What else can I answer for you? I guess I can talk a little bit more about the EHR while maybe like strategy while folks are folks are talking. Um, one of the reasons we're going to approach an EHR strategy from a portfolio level as opposed to a project level is we we understand that uh, we have to approach uh, like EHR interoperability through a lens of equity from our largest to our smallest providers that engage with us. Um, and, you know, when we think about building iteratively and iterative project management, we we want to be able to do that and execute pilots with EHRs without giving any one particular EHR a competitive advantage because we know that that's, you know, an inappropriate uh, um, positionality, put, uh, putting the, the BHA in. So um, we're, the reason we're kind of thinking of that on a more comprehensive level is just dealing with that level of, of competitiveness and making sure we're being equitable and approaching it, um, not ad hoc, um, but instead uh, through a more kind of holistic view. Hi, Abigail, I have a question. Yeah, go for it. I am interested in the dual diagnosis um, approach that you talked about. Um, one of the issues we see with dual diagnosis is um, 
the need to be easily moved between uh, primary, secondary, tertiary, and more mm -hmm. diagnoses and that it's not always correct that one diagnosis is always the primary and then you move back and forth very fluidly uh, between problem um, issues. So how how what is the approach to that? And that that kind of combines with the episode of care, and that episodes of care can be sometimes difficult to distinguish, or sometimes people come and go quite quickly. Um, how would an episode of care be actually defined? Yeah, that's a great question, and I think I can answer some of that now, and I think some of that will have to be answered in additional work on the data model that we can follow up with. I think that, um, you know, a lot of work was done in the Compass Initiative to think about how we, in, instead of having like a separate data model for CCAR and a separate data model for day codes, how do we create one data model that can accomplish um, all of the services uh, under both mental health, substance use, and dual diagnosis. So that's probably one of the first things that I would talk to you about is that um, we're working on that combined data model that we're hoping to share with with y'all shortly within that additional engagement effort that I've been mentioning um, that will give more specifics on what that would look like in practice. So that's one answer uh, about like the, the combination of the two. And we have great work from that compass work to build off of. So we're not we're not starting from square one, which is really lovely, but we are validating all of those findings from compass based on the, the research that we conducted here. And then to your second question around like what defines um, a, an episode of care, I think that we're still in the process of um, doing some piloting in our, our data systems um, as well as, um, you know, messing around or, or creating a couple of different definitions of that within a data, the data, the new data model. So um, I don't know that I have like an awesome answer for that right now, but that is something that we can dig deeper into around that like data model engagement group. And I hope that that is enough of an answer for now. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, great question. quiet group today. I was expecting all the questions, but maybe everybody's furiously typing into the feedback form, which is also awesome. All right. Well, I will say um, I'm going to stay on this call uh, for, you know, however long, you know, until 1030. Uh, I have my time booked. So I will stay here and keep the recording going in case folks want to stay on and ask questions. But that is the content that I had for today, um, knowing I wanted to book a large amount of time for discussion. Um, but if folks are not having as many questions, that is totally okay. Feel free to log off. Um, this recording will be posted on the project website, um, and we will go through that feedback process that I mentioned um, before, meaning that we will respond publicly to all pieces of feedback that we receive. Um, and conduct another series of sessions after we receive that feedback. And at that time, we'll also introduce ways that you can get involved in um, decision making around the data model and technology system. So this will definitely not be the last time we talk about this, um, but I will I will hang out here in case you people have any questions. Otherwise, feel free to take some time back in your your busy Monday, I'm sure.
I have another question if you want to indulge me, um, Abigail. Um, you may not be able to answer. It's really related to finances, financial support for uh, future changes in EHRs and things like that. Is the BHA committed to being able to help organizations to be able to afford that? Yeah, that's a great question. So one of the things that we were going to do once we get a little bit farther into what the data model might look like, as well as what technology system we'll be moving forward with, will be accompanied by a cost analysis where we determine what the cost for updates to provider technology will be for high mm -hmm. tech resource providers, as well as for lower tech resource providers. And I think at that time, we will bring that to BHA leadership and see what kind of financial support might be might be possible for that. So I don't have an answer right now, but I I we have a plan about how we will approach that. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Great question. Abigail, I guess I'm going to ask a question. Um, I am from Qualifax, which is CareLogic. Mm -hmm. um, and so we are a provider of uh, state reporting for you. Yep. Given the current path, from what I understand, it looks like you're talking about releasing the specs in July of 2013. Four. So then you're looking for implementation of July 25. Is that correct? So yes, that's a great question. So um, we will, July of 2024, June or July is like when we will have had appropriate time to stakeholder changes to the data model um, and to the technology system. And, and so that is when we're looking at, yes, exactly right, releasing those tech specs. But like we said, you know, we want to give providers at least a year in order to, you know, implement those changes. But just because we're giving folks that year doesn't mean that providers have to wait a year in order to sure. do that. So, well, just yeah. from an EHR perspective, it does usually take us anywhere between six and eight months, depending on the complexity of the bill to do that. So um, yep. giving us the year allows us to make sure we have room in our roadmap to address that. I guess my subsequent question to that is when they are released, um, what we have found a success is you know, as care logic being able to work directly with the state that if there is a question, like if we compare the old spec to the new spec or any questions on the file format of something that maybe not as clear, um, are we able to then set up meetings with you or do we have to go through a customer to get to you or what's that process look like for Colorado? Yeah, so I don't think we know that yet, but I think what I can say is that whatever we do will you know be offered to to everyone so there won't be like individual sit downs with particular ehrs um but rather probably a comprehensive ehr process for how we answer those types of questions so okay. um i don't know exactly what that will look like i have to talk with my colleagues about that um but i think it's a great point and i can definitely promise to follow up with some more detail there yeah, we'd appreciate that. We've definitely seen where there's been times um, a customer isn't necessarily able to answer a question about the technical spec level for us. And so we need to talk to someone at the state to get some clarification on the language or the structure. Um, so definitely that'd be something great to have in your, your radar. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Jessica. And I also think that, you know, I mentioned that portfolio wide EHR strategy. And I imagine that part of that strategy will be how do we better provide documentation to our EHR partners? And how do we make that documentation really usable and effective and impactful? So uh, also look out for kind of that, that effort in general. Uh, and I can make sure to follow up with you um, on that particular point. That'd be great. Thank you so much. Cool. Thank you. Um, for those who just joined, um, we're just staying on the line in case anybody has any additional questions, but we went through the majority of our content. Um, so we're just hanging out here until 1030 or until everybody logs off, um, just as a, as a FYI. But yeah, feel free to ask any questions also.
Thanks, Megan. All right, I'm going to turn off the recording.